the CTMU is a is an advanced meta language for science. Okay, it's a metaphysical meta language, and it's absolutely logically necessary. And the cognitive theoretic model of the universe, uh, well, it consists of, of three ingredients. One of them is cognitive theory, one of them is universe, and one of them is model. You can think of the cognitive theory as being a description of the universe, which is a set of perceptions. And then you can think about the model as being the descriptive mapping that ties the two together. <clears throat> Ordinarily, a theory is separate from the universe and the model, but if you take those three ingredients and you tie them together, you fuse them, you contract them into one underlying entity, then you get the CTMU. That's how the CTMU is quantized. All three of these things are brought together. It is the logic of experience. To derive the CTMU, you start with experience. You start with, with cogito and essi. You logically induce the minimum model, the bare minimum that you need to make cognition and percep perception work. The CTMU takes those things, couples them, and then seeks the, the basic fundamental model of how those, what those things are and how they get coupled. And in so doing, it comes up with an identity, something that distributes over everything in reality. And then it quantizes reality in terms of that identity so that everything stays homogeneous and coherent and unified. Ontology and epistemology are coupled in the CTMU in a, in a, in a particular way. And uh, uh, the CTMU takes the form, because of that coupling, it takes the form of something called an intrinsic language, which is really a completely self-referential language that is coupled with its own manifold, so that the universe of the language is included in the language itself. And in addition, the model or the mapping between the theory and the universe is also included in the theory. Structurally fusing language and universe into a single coherent identity on the highest possible level of discourse, featuring an intrinsic definition of language which is analogous to intrinsic geometry in its self-containment and external independence. It consists entirely of identities or coherent self-dual language universe couplings and the operators and operations which generate and act on them. This intrinsic language is a comprehensive and therefore totally self-contained reality with respect to which nothing deeper or more extensive exists. Sure, the CTMU is, is an identity of reality. It's basically an intention-extension coupling that, is, that has ontic bearing. It actually explains how reality generates itself. Intensian indicates the internal content of a term or concept, whereas extension indicates the full set of objects to which the term applies. Moving from left to right, M equals L int says that the metaformal system is an intrinsic language. Complete self-containment is required of both M and L int, implying structural equivalence. It turns out that this intrinsic language doubles as a pair of complementary semi-languages, LS and LO, that are in fact dual to each other insofar as they comprise the intentional and extensional aspects of M. In the CTMU, we have, we've got an overall language that has basically two semi-languages. M produces the extensional semi-language LO from its dual intentional semi-language LS. The intentional aspect of M is a self-configuring, self-processing language, and the extensional aspect couples to this language is a pointwise distribution of its syntax, which provides the language with instances. The CTMU metaformal system is an intrinsic language, the involutional coupling of a language with a manifold whose points are the elements of the signature of the language, or in semiotic terminology, its signs. In reality, you had signs, basically it's got a semiotic ontology in which you've got signs uh, that uh, represent objects and then they turn into interpretants. Right? In other words, things that are actually mental images of, of whatever it is that the sign represents. This, is, this property of triadicity in the CTMU becomes triality. And that is what I just explained. It's a language that is at once its own universe and its own model. If one were to say that, that reality is a sign that, is, that represents itself, 
and that gives rise to an interpretant, which is then goes back goes back and becomes another sign, which is then converted into an interpretant, and so on in a in a cyclical fashion. That's the kind of ontology we're talking about with the CTMU, with this trialic theory that we have. Mm, sure, the metaformal system is simply a language that it, that is quantized not in terms of signs, but in terms of syntax syntactors and identification events. Right? Syntactor is an active sign. It's something that actually has two data types, a syntactic data type and an input data type. It can accept things from the external world, process them internally, which gives it an internal state, and then, you know, release its processing back into the real world, its output. Okay, that's a syntactor. It's fundamentally different from a sign. The metaformal system is very close to the way in which formal languages are defined, with a signature, a grammar, and a set of linear strings. The fundamental objects of M are active signs called tellers N and syntactors T. These are the subsets N and T of the signature sigma. The signs in sigma are all identity operators which use M as an identity language to identify the world, hence all are syntactors. Temporal sequences of the successive collapsed states of objects. The strings of sigma are linear ectomorphic in both directions, with objects traveling along linear paths or trajectories. This is called the linear ectomorphic semi-model of the conspansive manifold, associated with display space T. N and T, which can be respectively likened to the internal and external, and are the mental and physical aspects of reality, have some amount of overlap. Every teller is a syntactor, but not every syntactor is a teller. Primary and secondary syntactors are tellers, but tertiary syntactors are not. Tellers can exist in both N and T. Tertiary syntactors can exist only in T. String sigma within T, the set of terminal strings of M, consists of the external states and trajectories of syntactors. String sigma, associated with the semi language LO, occupies the surface structure of N. A, a language, a lot of people think that, well, a language is simply something that we speak that comes out of your mouth. It's not, it's an algebraic structure. It actually has, uh, has elements of operations and it's a form of algebra. But it's a very general form of algebra because anything that we can think about and formulate obviously is a language. It's got to conform to the rules of language, otherwise it's unintelligible. So in a, in a sense, language is the most general algebraic structure. Therefore, when we talk about the most likely algebraic structure to apply to the universe as a whole, it's definitely got to be language because that's the most general. In other words, reality has to be a language. And this goes together with bringing all three of those ingredients, language, universe, and model together. Obviously, the structure of each is a part of the whole, characterizes the whole distributively. Yeah, basically, there is no experience without linguistic or syntactic content. Experience presupposes this infrastructure that I'm talking about. Language is the medium of information, and language has syntax. The discipline of philosophy is supposed to become an actual foundational language for, for all the branches of philosophy, right? And by foundational, we mean comprehensive and fundamental. Okay, that language is called the CTMU. It's the foundational language for everything else. The content of the flow is determined by the telic recursive feedback of LS, the dynamical semi-language of M, and LO, the static semi-language of M. Reality is a self-resolving paradox. All right? It... it Obviously, it has objects which are persistent. They retain the same identities, things that retain the same identities, and yet it changes. What is it that remains the same and yet changes? That is a paradox, okay? It either remains the same or it changes. In fact, reality does both, okay? So there you have a paradox, but it self-resolves by stratifying its evolution in a certain way described within the CTMU. <clears throat> All right, and in one of these semi-languages, which is static, all right, there are no contradictory states. In the other, which is dynamical and actually determines the evolution of the universe, contradictory states are allowed within potentials, namely quantum wave functions. 
Quantum metamechanics maps wave functions in general to identities, consisting of superpositions of the M semi languages LS and LO, and these are not merely optional. It is in the sense of potential, in the sense that potentials are real. Potentials do consist of contradictory states. Okay, something can, uh, a quantum can be measured with, uh, if it's an electron, it can be measured with spin up or spin down, for example. And the potential, the wave function itself, actually contains both of those contradictory states. Okay, but that wave function has to collapse in order to fully enter reality the actual part of reality, it's going to have to collapse to just one of those states, thereby eliminating the contradiction. So once again, reality is a self-resolving paradox. LS and LO correspond to the linguistic structure superimposed by M on the set's end and T respectively. Simplistically, LS exists inside secondary tellers of N, while LO consists of the external states and trajectories or state transitions of their constituent tertiary syntactors. Back in the uh, 19th century, for example, uh, they thought there was something, physical theory contained something called the luminiferous ether. And uh, that was basically uh, mapped into physical reality as a kind of a space-filling substance, or perhaps as space itself. Then, when Einstein, uh, Einstein came along with the theory of relativity, he changed physical theory so that luminous, uh, luminiferous ether disappeared. Well, it, the CTMU is designed so that you can interpret the perspectives of all of those people in it, all right? Basically, it is a universal modeling apparatus that you can take all of those perspectives, and some of those perspectives are in the semi-language, uh, the static semi-language, and others of those perspectives more or less correspond to the dynamic semi-language. Mm -hmm. Heisenberg is in the latter, okay? Einstein and Bohm are in the former, okay? Uh, but one thing that we know about Einstein and Bohm is that their perspectives were essentially dualistic. Now, we could go into the theory of relativity, and I could show you how Einstein was definitely foreshadowing something like self-duality. But nominally speaking, he was dualistic. He thought that there was an independent reality that was completely independent of, of human observers and human cognition. Right? And this is simply not the case. There is a semi-language of the CTMU in which it is the case. However, when we consider the dynamical semi-language, that goes straight to hell. This is once again logical, and it can be proven. Uh, you know, the whole idea is that, uh, is that as the universe cools, you get broken symmetries if you regress. Going back towards the instant of time, those, those symmetries actually arise, things come together, converge on, uh, on, uh, on commonalities, until finally you get all the way back to one comprehensive distributive identity. And this is, uh, of course, what, what most people call quantum gravity. It's the idea of, of uh, working gravity in with the other uh, elementary forces. And, uh, but the CTMU takes a logical perspective on all this. The, the metaformal system is a foundational language. It is presented as a foundational language for mathematics, physics, the sciences, pretty much everything. Okay, set theory can't pull that off, and neither can category theory. But on the other hand, if you once you've defined the metaformal system, you get to make use of both of those other languages as you see fit. You can pull anything out of them you want. Right? The important thing is that you have the metaformal system, which is the, the very outside, item-potent meta-language that spans between these two so-called fundamental languages, set theory and category theory. And of course, they, they, they say there's already a blend between set theory and category theory called topos theory, but that too leaves something to be desired. There's a lot of missing structure there. It doesn't qualify as a foundation language. Despite the fact that the metaformal system can be described by a formal system, it is a metalanguage of not only the formal systems in question, but of itself. Formal systems can be located or assigned a place in M as referential content on the basis of shared structure, in other words, on the basis of their degree of validity. This is because any sufficiently expressive formal language with an easily recognized grammar can be incorporated in a formal system.
that involves the use of something called a, a meta language where you attach truth values to physical attributions. Physicists did not understand and still do not understand the structure of the meta language that they need to do things like that. And it's called metaphysics. In other words, physicists actually need metaphysics. They need a metaphysical meta language to actually make changes like this, to, to pass, to, to affix truth values to physical attributions, to change their theories, to correct their theories, and things like that. The amazing thing is they don't realize this. They still don't realize it. They don't realize that, that physics has actually absorbed metaphysics of necessity. It needs metaphysical functionality in order to do this. It's kind of a hit and miss thing where we're, we're following the scientific method, where we're empirically inducing theories, and we're sort of affixing them or gluing them onto observations in physical reality, but we don't know how or why that is happening. It's some kind of lucky break that we're getting, right? It's, it's the, 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 uh, the unexpected efficiency of mathematics, of, of, of being able to actually use mathematical models on reality, all right? They don't have a meta language whose structure actually tells them why that's occurring. That's what we're trying to help fix with the CTMD. And we're getting a lot of bonuses. You know, there are a lot of things that you can do with the CTMU. For example, physicists are trying to explain dark energy. They're never going to do it until they have the CTMU. The CTMU is the offers the only viable explanation for dark energy. And there are other things, consciousness, there are all kinds of things that cannot be explained without this meta language, this metaphysical meta language, and the admission on the parts of scientists and physicists in particular, that metaphysics is already built into their discipline. You can't get by without it. So this is what's the matter with science. It doesn't understand the language in terms of which it's theories are formulated or how they relate to the physical universe. Okay, they need a meta language to actually put those two things together. That's the coupling. The meta language provides the, couple, the coupling for subjective and objective reality. And the lack of such a meta language means that they can't actually put those two things together. How they could still be ignorant of it, I'm not quite sure.